All right. Well, thank you guys very much, uh, and I welcome you for this last ride of the conference. So <laughs> where did this come from? So when we were uh, approached by Oaks back in the fall, um, way before we had our adventures here in Kentucky, I was working with a couple of farms out on the West Coast who were dealing with some of the serious droughts out there and um, dealing with wildfires sort of coming through. And I was thinking, you know, how does, we were talking about, okay, how do animals interact with the environment and that, you know, and our soils and our things like that, you know, following the theme of, of John Kemp and that with this conference. And I thought, you know what, let's bring in this other element of talking about, you know, as things change, um, as we're sort of moving forward into the future and that, how does that interaction change and how do we sort of end up sort of getting ready for it? So since then and that, um, our roller coasters got a little bit more wild in Kentucky and that um, with our December sort of tornadoes and that coming through. But we've also seen things not necessarily in Kentucky, but other parts of the, uh, of the North America and that this was taken up in British Columbia and that with some of the floods that they had um, sort of this, this winter and that. Um, and of course, a lot of dairy farms sort of up in that area and that and um, a lot of sort of issues um, with making sure that they can get cows safe and stuff like that. So dealing with emergencies right on the ground. And um, I don't know how many of you guys, if any of you have jerseys, but you appreciate this picture. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so when we're going through with this, I thought, you know, let's sit down and sort of talk, take this, this new sort of um, window to look at this question of, you know, how do our animals sort of interact with the environment and the farms that we're dealing with and look at sort of how do we end up responding as that all begins to change. So as we're looking at this, we'll talk about some of the changes we're likely to be seeing in Kentucky sort of moving forward. And um, we'll present some ideas, at least from my perspective, you know, what do we need to think about in that um, when we're going through responding to them. Now, one thing I will say in the opening of this is I am not a meteorologist and I'm not necessarily an expert on, you know, farm infrastructure and emergency response. So the goal of this is not necessarily to tell you this is exactly what you need to do to your farm. It's more to get you guys thinking, you know, thinking about, hey, especially the young guys in the room, you know, as you guys are looking through the rest of your sort of farming career and that, you know, what things are going to be changing. It's not going to be your father's farm um, that we're going to be looking at as we're moving forward. And what things are going to change that you can maybe be thinking about today, putting in changes in that that could make a huge difference as, you know, the climate changes a little bit and as we see some sort of differences in the year as you deal with it, you know, in the seasons and the things like that, sort of getting through to it. Um, and a couple of ideas, I, I sort of love this sort of proverb, the prudent per person foresees danger ahead and takes precautions. The simpleton goes blindly on and suffers the consequence. So hopefully, as I said, I won't give you all the answers, but at least sow that seed of thinking about how do we end up sort of thinking about the future and that and thinking long-term wise and that, how to prepare for it and that. So first of all, talking about heat, you know, and this is something we're absolutely not foreign to in Kentucky. You know, we know sort of hot weather here and that, but looking at some of the projections and that sort of moving forward, you know, we're, when they look back the last 20 years, we've actually been quite cushioned from some of the changes that have happened already in Kentucky because of our sort of environment, the fact that we've got a very forested state, you know, there's been some mitigation of the sort of changes that have been seen out west and that, that we've been kind of cushioned from in that a little bit here. We've also been seeing there's a little bit more sort of sulfates or sulfites that are in the atmosphere that have kind of had a dampening effect that we haven't seen too bad of a change yet. Those both are all starting to change as we're moving forward. So this sort of acceleration in warming um, as we go into the next half of the century or the rest of the sort of 20th century is really going to start picking up. So up till about now, we've been seeing about 16 really sort of hot days. You know, those days that are above sort of 105 on, on sort of heat index and that. That's only going to start sort of getting tougher, you know, and getting hotter as we're sort of moving forward. So you think about those tough days and just getting through that week, you know, oftentimes when we hit it this summer, you know, this summer and that, those are going to be like a month long and that. So really sort of thinking about how do I plan for that when it's a longer stretch that we're dealing with, you know, and what could we be foreseeing? Then sort of looking through and just saying, you know, as we're looking at these sort of harder days, you know, what is going to be shifting in, in the sort of environment and that, you know, as we're working through. 
what's it going to do to our cows? You know, what are we likely to be seeing in that, you know, as we're looking at sort of the effects of, of the sort of heat stress and that, you know, on our animals and that. And we're talking cows mostly because that's my focus, but a lot of those um, sort of effects are going to be very similar in that when we're looking sort of across animals. Um, when we're looking at our dairy cows and that, you know, they're a lot more sensitive than us, you know, right at actually about 72 degrees when we're about 50% humidity. And I mean, how many days in the summer are we only at 50% humidity here in Kentucky and that? But this is when they'll start to sort of feel the effects of sort of heat stress and that. Um, you know, as we're ending up sort of, you know, seeing that little bit more of an effect in that, you know, that low stress, you're probably not going to see a lot of signs sort of really in the cows. Maybe you'll see a little bit more sort of standing, a little bit increased sort of respiratory rate. As we're getting sort of more up into the effects, you'll see faster respiratory rate. That's usually one of the, the first signs that'll start to sort of come up. They're panting a lot more. If you happen to take a temperature on the cow, which we would as vets and that, but you're not necessarily going to be in the habit of doing that on a daily basis and that, that'll be your next sort of lagging indicator, you know, that that temperature will start to come up sort of following the, the respiratory rate. And then as we're getting sort of further in the stress, that's when you start seeing the sort of open mouth breathing, you know, the panting, um, you know, the, the sort of little bit more of a depression and less of a focus on the daily behaviors. Now, as I said, even in the milder effects, we're going to be seeing effects on those animals or those groups of animals uh, sort of moving forward. You know, we all know that lag in, in sort of milk production or overall production because they're not necessarily going to be sort of eating as heavily. Um, you know, those are usually going to be a day or two sort of following in that, but we're also seeing sort of issues in that with overall health because of that sort of lag. So we tend to see more mastitis in our fresh cows and that we're going to be seeing sort of more diseases in that transitional diseases, uh, um, sort of metritis and stuff like that or infections in that poor repro, you know, for those animals that are stressed. And we always sort of tend to see these cycles where don't get bred through the summer, they get bred in the fall. And then here we go again, you know, with with cows sort of freshening coming into the hot period and that sort of going through. So a lot of the sort of, um, you know, the perpetuating the problems. One of the other challenges which they're starting to look into is actually also the effects that go on to the next generation. So um, calves that are in utero and that during a really heavy sort of heat period and that they found, yes, those are going to be a little sort of weaker when they hit the ground. You know, their mothers are likely sort of to have challenges and that the first sort of portion of lactation, but following those heifer calves on to the next, to their sort of first lactation and that and moving forward, their overall production is going to be much lower than a cow that was normal in a cool, or sort of gestated in a cool uh, time of the year and that. So the effects of, of sort of heat stress and that can go on even beyond, you know, the, the, the sort of week or two weeks and that, that we're dealing with it and that, that it can actually affect really sort of long term. So it's definitely something to sort of think about, okay, you know, how are we going to end up sort of going through and, and sort of addressing this? But then also, um, when we're dealing with Kentucky, you know, we've got this challenge also of humidity. Um, and when it comes to the humidity, this isn't necessarily something that's going to increase, although our dew point's increasing slightly um, as we're moving forward in the next couple of years and that. But it's something that's definitely going to make it a lot more challenging when we're looking at ways to mitigate um, sort of the heat and that as we're moving forward. This I found, I found this lovely little sort of map and that that sort of gives you an idea, you know, as we're moving forward um, sort of the next couple of years, our weather here in Kentucky, Paducah and that's going to be far more like, you know, southern Texas when we're um, sort of looking at what it's going to be changing to. So you think about the wicked hot days that we have there, but also, you know, what are the parasites and the pests that they're dealing with, you know, in a lot more sort of almost semi-tropical sort of environments in that, you know, hotter environments in that where we're dealing with, you know, far higher tick burdens. We're dealing with sort of different pests and that, um, you know, little bit of flukes and some of the things like that in more tropical areas and that, that we don't necessarily have here. So, um, you know, how's that going to change as we're moving forward? So preparing in that, and we're going to look a little bit more sort of at pasture systems in that, you know, one of the first big things is water, you know, and we, of course, all, you know, you're out on a hot day in that, you'll appreciate the fact of how important water is, you know, as we're seeing sort of an increase. And I mean, some of our cows, each degree that we're going up, their water consumption will be going up very significantly in that, that we're running into sort of 90 degree days. A lot of them will be taking in, you know, 25 to sort of 35 gallons. So making sure there's plenty of water there available. 
And then when we're looking at sort of water on pasture, I think at this stage with what we're looking at in Kentucky, the idea of sending those cows back to the barn as we get into these hotter days, you know, you're really going to be adding that additional stress. So looking into water systems on pasture. And when we're looking at water systems on pasture and that, you know, setting that distance to the trough, you know, as little as about 600 feet, because that's where our change in behavior comes, you know, for cattle and that. So they have to go a long distance beyond 600 feet, then they're going to go as a group and they're going to drink together. And then, of course, you need a much bigger trough, you know, much more flow volume in that um, to make sure that that whole group can go through and drink together bring that trough a lot closer to them, so within that 600 feet, and they're going to do a lot more visits to the trough, but you're also going to not necessarily see that herd behavior, where they're really sort of coming in as a group. I say in here, and that um, avoid sort of ponds and streams, and of course we've got two sort of the challenges there, you know, is just managing sort of water quality, you know, if we're using sort of natural systems in that, both for the, the water itself, but then also sort of the animals sort of coming back. So ponds, we have to worry about sort of allergies and that and toxicities and that, but then also sort of water quality if we're using the streams. So um, I'm not necessarily a huge advocate of using sort of natural water systems. A couple of ideas. So this is one of our farms um, that's up in sort of Wisconsin and that, but they've got sort of water lines that are set right along um, their sort of um, cattle pathways and that, and then they'll use these sort of buckets that they'll run along or sort of water troughs. So they're not necessarily big, but they're close enough that they're not necessarily needing too heavy of a, of a size in that because the cattle are coming to them more frequently. This is more of a local farm. So um, set out with really nice sort of water lines, got nice protection in that, both from cattle and the elements and that, and then you can just run a hose out sort of in each of those sort of pastures, and there's the trough sort of that's associated um, with that. So this is a, another farm in that. This is also actually Wisconsin, but they had not necessarily had the opportunity yet to put in heavy infrastructure of putting in water lines to all the pastures. So they took the approach of doing more of a mobile um, sort of water tank in that. So they've got, this is, you know, their tank of water in that. And then, as you can see, not necessarily a huge trough, but sturdy enough and they can take that right to the cattle. So that can go follow them around sort of in the pasture that they've always got a water source right there. Next, we'll be looking at shade and trees. Um, and by the way, as you guys are thinking of sort of water systems in that, um, you know, there are absolutely sort of NRCS grants and things like that that often will focus on water with the idea NRCS always looking at environmental stuff but increasing grazing and sustainability of grazing in that, um, you know, will often end up sort of being something that they will help uh, sort of sponsor and that will, will provide grants for. So that's a definite opportunity in that if you're looking to make improvements to look in for any available sort of grants in the area. So next one on that, we'll look at sort of shade in that. And this is certainly something that you know, Kentucky, we have plenty of trees, but we're not necessarily strategic um, about how we end up sort of using trees and that, you know, as our shade sort of on pasture and that. Um, when we're looking at how much we need, you know, we're usually looking at at least sort of 40 square feet per animal. Um, you know, so one shade tree in the pasture or a line of trees, and we often end up running into cows congregating. Um, and a large sort of muddy mess in that, you know, where we end up sort of, um, you know, with the group standing under there. So that's where some of the sort of silver pasture in that. Um, and this is one of our farms actually up in Maryland in that. So starting to really strategically sort of put in trees, diversity spaced in that within the pasture um, so that you're not providing necessarily shade concentrated in one area, but there's plenty of opportunity in that for the cattle to go through and uh, um, sort of find, find shade without necessarily congregating heavily. This is something as you guys are thinking about that long term. I would think about this now because of course you're looking at, hey, you know, I need something down the line and that that's going to make a difference. This will take a long time to, to sort of put into place and that and really build out. If you haven't got the time yet, um, this is actually the same farm that has the mobile sort of water tank in that. They've built this and this was um, a trailer chassis um, that they'd ended up sort of going through and converting and you can see the, um, the what's his name, um, hitch and that there. Um, and that's completely mobile that they can hook that up and just sort of move it with a tractor. But this has just got shade cloth sort of stretched across. 
So they can get sort of the whole group of cattle sort of under there easily and that, and they move that with the, with the cattle sort of each day and that from pasture to pasture. If you uh, want to look for the ready-made version in that, this is a company called Shadehaven um, that makes, makes these sort of commercial versions in that um, of the sort of shade area and that. And these can end up, it actually folds sort of up. Um, so this will end up sort of parting and it can fold up in that in, in severe weather or for moving it. But they're actually quite sturdy. This is one that is on a, a grazing project um, that Organic Valley does up in Wisconsin that we've, we've ended up sort of trialing one of these shade havens sort of up there and it's had a couple of windstorms come through and it's been pretty sort of sturdy with sort of standing up to it. So we've been fairly impressed with, you know, with how well it actually sort of works out on pasture. So then also looking through, and this is something I think is, you know, critical both for, you know, those farms that are organic, but then also sort of looking at making the most out of your, your grazing is really thinking about, you know, when are we out sort of grazing and making the most of the cool times of the day, you know, morning, evening, but then also overnights um, and really sort of being strategic about, um, you know, when do we end up sort of getting the cattle out and pasture. And our next topic we'll talk about is housing, you know, how, what do we do with them when they're in the barns? Um, because unfortunately, you know, we do need a significant sort of place to keep them cool and that in the most sort of severe parts of the day. But then also sort of pasture choices. So really sort of watching the weather as you're moving forward. And this challenge, of course, in Kentucky is that, you know, we add that uh, additional dimension of, of sort of, um, you know, complexity where we're not just looking at pasture rotations, but if you're trying to focus in on heat mitigation as well, you know, which pastures are going to be best for the hotter days and that, um, you know, and which pastures and that will, will sort of be better for the cooler days and that. So it's definitely a little bit more challenging um, sort of moving forward but then also sort of strategically using housing, you know, um, sort of as you can and that to keep mitigating. Indoor housing itself and that, you know, things that we can look at, um, and this is getting much, much more into the sort of conventional, um, sort of daring conventional ag, you know, they're much more focused because there's more time indoors, you know, and how we can end up sort of mitigating heat. So fans um, and sort of ventilation systems, and the one thing I sort of toyed with is there's a lot of, down in Florida and the southern states, we'll tend to see these tunnel ventilation systems and that with cooling cells that can really take the temperature down in the barn a couple of degrees. You know, the challenge with looking at that within Kentucky is number one, the, you know, within sort of grazing systems is the investment, you know, that we're putting into it for the period of time you'd be in there. But then also, you know, would it be more challenging bringing the cows, you know, from an outside environment sort of in and, and that sort of change going through but as our nighttime temperatures sort of get hotter and that for those periods where we were just not getting even below sort of, you know, 80 degrees and allowing those animals to cool down overnight, it's certainly something that I put in the back of my head, you know, and saying, hey, is there something else that we need, you know, as we're getting into more sort of challenging times and that to look at. I have sprinklers on here. Oops. Sprinklers on here and then misters as well. Now, misters are something they use very heavily out west in the really dry environments because they'll sort of mist a fine mist and that that doesn't necessarily settle on the cows but as it evaporates it cools the environment around them. Of course that works well in low humidity where you're getting quick evaporation not necessarily so well in really humid environments like Kentucky so I wouldn't necessarily put misters here but a good sprinkler um, and really sort of going through and soaking in that would be something that would really sort of work fairly well. But then also thinking of bedding choices, like potentially things like sand and that, that are not necessarily going to insulate, um, but could be a better and cooler sort of, um, you know, form of bedding and that through the, through the sort of hot period. Now, when we're looking at heat stress, um, particularly in dairies, your holding pens, you know, are going to be your hottest area, you know, so how long cows are congregated and kept sort of in the holding pens and that, you know, are going to be some of the hottest stuff. So looking through and really managing when these girls are congregated like this and when they can't necessarily cool so focusing not just on fans but how what group sizes do you have in there you know and how long are they sort of congregated so really sort of maybe bringing in smaller groups for shorter periods and that through the through the hottest times of the year and then this is this one was actually this picture was one of the farms i used to work at in pennsylvania um, and they have this it's, it's not necessarily a sprinkler system because when you see the amount of water that's coming off there, it's far more actually like a shower um, that these cows are going through. 
And they built this themselves where they set up a motion sensor that senses as that cow approaches it and runs a sort of shower for a beef pit as she's sort of passing beneath it and that and really soaks the cows down as they're moving through. And they just found it was a much more strategic way to cool those cows when they knew they were coming out of a really sort of hot area and that and get the most sort of bang for their buck with, with sort of cooling and getting them out sort of cooler from the parlor. The other thing is also sort of looking at water, you know, outside of the parlor and that. So having a, a good sort of water trough and that with an easy access sort of coming out of the parlor to cool, cool those girls as they're coming out. So then looking at sort of management, just thinking of how you're running your day. So minimizing handling and that, you know, when we know it's going to be sort of the hottest parts of the day, you know, and we're really sort of stressing those, those animals and that. Minimizing the times that we're going to get them sort of crowded together. So we've talked about the holding pen, but also hauling, you know, any major movement. And then sort of walking distances. So hot days, you know, maybe we think of the sort of closer pastures, you know, or when we're coming back in sort of in the evenings or hot parts of the day. And then how can we manage our, our higher risk groups like fresh cows and that, you know, so that we're, we're decreasing that sort of stress and that potential, um, you know, for them because they're going to be feeling the effects of it more, you know, the potential for sort of illness and that coming through. Um, and then also looking at feeds. So we know when we're, when we're drinking a lot more and they're really sort of, um, you know, passing through a lot more um, sort of urine, we're losing minerals as we're going through. So really focusing on electrolytes um, and making sure that we're sort of mitigating for any potential losses on those hot days. And not as much of an issue in our herds, but decreasing sort of energy in that because the hotter the rations, you know, the more heat generation we're going to end up sort of getting our higher forage rations most of the time are not necessarily going to be as heat generating, you know, when we're looking at uh, um, sort of organic farms and that. Last thing is looking at um, sort of breed selection and that. Um, and you guys, uh, I think you went to Melvin's yesterday and that you'll see some of the fleck bees sort of out there and that, you know, picking breeds that are going to be a little bit more resistant uh, to sort of hotter temperatures and that. And this is a, a um, and I always get the name wrong in that with them, a Gurolando. Um, so this is a Brazilian sort of dairy mix in that, uh, that they'd ended up sort of breeding Holstein to some of their, their local cattle to create the sort of crossbred, which was much more resilient to the hot, humid temperatures and that down in Brazil. So really thinking a little bit more diversely about, you know, what breeds do we end up sort of selecting that are a lot more resilient long-term and that to, to the temperatures that we're running into. So then the mugginess and that, and we talked a little bit about it with cooling. It definitely makes it a lot more challenging in that, but it's also going to make us potentially more susceptible to um, sort of issues with our sort of parasites and some of our sort of pests and that sort of moving forward. And Dr. Guy talked a little bit about it, but newer diseases coming in, um, such as filaria and that. So... This is, um, you know, just going through because we know, and someone had asked in that last lecture about, you know, do we end up killing uh, some of the parasites on pastures through the winter? And we know sort of generally when we're talking about sort of kill off in pastures and that, we're not getting cold enough winters um, really in sort of Kentucky to do a good clear. And the other thing during the summers is if we get hot, dry summers, that's great. You know, that will help us sort of clear out but hot, wet summers are going to really sort of perpetuate in that, that we'll be seeing sort of more issues with parasites. So we're really going to have to focus on really good sort of parasite management and moving forward. I won't delve into this. These are the, the longhorn ticks and that that Dr. Guy sort of talked about. And just seeing, you know, anytime you're seeing a heavier, heavier burden in that, this is a different type of uh, sort of tick that we're dealing with in that um, rather than our typical sort of dog ticks in that that we'll tend to deal with sort of more um, in this area. Anyone have an idea of what this is? Yeah. Armadillo. Armadillo. So has anyone seen one yet on their farms? Ah, so these guys, this is one of the more fun things that are coming up in that with the warming temperatures. So these guys are already in Tennessee, armadillos and that. And the closest I've seen was Orlando, Tennessee. So. A friend of mine and I have a running bet on who sees the first one on the farm in Kentucky. So you'll have to let me know if you see him in armadillo because these are coming up as well as we're seeing sort of uh, warming the climate. So not necessarily something to worry about with warming climates, but something a lot more fun. There's a couple of them that are longer very similar. All right. That's where I've seen them on the road. Yep. 
So there's, they're, they're definitely sort of coming up to this area in that. I have yet to see a live one, but um, I'm looking for them. I'm looking for them. So, All right. But then also, so we talked a little bit about more sort of issues with, um, you know, we'll talk a little bit more about issues with rain and that, but we're also going to see a higher propensity for drought um, as we're looking forward in that to the future. And when we look back um, sort of over the last 16 years and that, there were actually about 11 years um, of drought sort of in, in Kentucky and that um, sort of looking back through. And as they look at the trends moving forward, it's likely to sort of increase. So overall, looking at our likelihood in that or rainfall moving forward, the rainfall for Kentucky is likely to increase by about 5% year on year moving forward. That seems counterintuitive to the whole idea of droughts, but they're finding that that rainfall is going to be far more concentrated in specific sort of rainfall events. So that 5% is going to be probably in the four highest rainfalls of the year rather than spread out through the year. But looking at the summers itself, we're going to be seeing a lot more of a propensity to see drought. And for you guys, unfortunately, in Western Kentucky, when we're looking at Kentucky, the Western portion and that's going to be the sort of one that's more susceptible for some of the sort of drying we're seeing here. So really sort of thinking about, hey, you know, we're not hopefully going to be as bad as what they're seeing out West, but we probably will be seeing more of a challenge with rainfall than what we have seen in the past in that um, for Kentucky. So thinking about our sort of choices sort of moving forward, hopefully we'll never get quite to that point. But, um, you know, really sort of starting to focus on first thing, and Dr. Guy talked a lot about it, and I'll harp on it as well, good pasture management and rotation. So anything that we can do with good perennial pastures to build those deep roots um, when we're going through and building healthy sort of grazing systems and that are going to make them far more resilient uh, to drought as we're moving forward. The deeper those roots, the more likely they're going to be able to maintain health in that even in the drier periods. And when we're getting rain and that, when it does end up coming through, they tend to bounce back a lot faster. Going through and looking at your choices, um, sort of, of forages and thinking each year as we're sort of going through in that about, you know, do we end up putting species in in our pasture mixes that we know have deep roots, like some of our sort of legumes that tend to have sort of a deeper root in that within there, mixing those within the, within the sort of um, stand and that to make sure to get some sort of resilience in that through the through the um, sort of drier parts of the year. And then even looking at, you know, your choices. So looking at sort of warm season sort of grasses and that, or warm season perennials and that within the pasture, something like a Bermuda grass you're adding in. Um, looking at maybe even annuals, if we know we're likely to have a difficult year. And I'm not a huge advocate for annuals, but it is certainly something to consider if we need a holdout. You know, if we know we're going to be running into a challenging season, um, you know, running into sort of a field of annuals that can help us sort of carry through. We had a farm um, down in Tennessee we've been working with that had a bit of a challenge with pastures this past year, and they put in crabgrass based on the extension sort of recommendations and got a huge bumper crop of it. So not something I would have considered um, before going into that sort of situation as a, as a really good sort of crop for the hot, hot areas and that, but... Um, it, they really ended up that sort of carried them through the whole summer and that with having that sort of field of, of crabgrass going through. And that's something he's seeing some regrowth, even though it's a, an annual and that some regrowth just from reseeding and that sort of going through. So that's certainly an option. Then also sort of considering in that, and this is um, sort of looking at good sort of pasture rotation, but considering, you know, whether it's worth um, looking at irrigation and that. Um, and it seems something completely foreign in Kentucky you know, um, to be looking at sort of irrigation on pasture, but that might be something that's worth considering sort of looking at long term and that. So these are the sort of K-pods um, that we tend to see a lot more sort of in the East Coast and some of the systems there. And then you'll see here, um, we see a lot of this on our arable farms and that, but not necessarily as much on pasture. You know, the classic sort of irrigation pivots, we see a lot more of these out west and that, um, you know, on grazing farms out there. So... Flip side of that, looking at sort of the wet weather, and we said there was going to be this increase of sort of 5% overall um, on our rainfall. Um, as I said, those are going to come more lightly in sort of heavy rain events. And the worst part of it is most of them are going to be our sort of winter rainfalls and that. So that this sort of wet season where we're seeing quite a lot of the sort of heavier rains in the winter and that, that's where we're going to be seeing a little bit more of our increase of sort of wetness. So 
with that and the addition of you know more frost free days um, going through our winters we're going to be dealing likely with a lot more mud um, as we're going through sort of future years and that and so how to end up sort of preparing in that and mitigating in that for for the mud is going to be a challenge as we're sort of moving forward so um, same thing as i was talking about with the heat the challenge we run into is you know, having good housing as much as we don't necessarily sort of want to rely too heavily on it and that, that gives us at least a way to sort of end up managing um, when we've got the worst of the, the worst of the uh, sort of mud periods and that, you know, knowing how to be able to sort of manage cattle. But then also looking at strategic use. So, um, you know, if you're feeding out on pasture using sort of heavy use areas, or planning ahead, you know, so setting um, stockpiled pastures that we've got pastures we know we can end up sort of turning cattle into. There's enough um, sort of growth and deep roots there uh, that you're going to be able to sort of mitigate mud going, going forward. Looking at placing sort of round bales in that, you know, maybe during the drier portion of the season in that, and then using electric fence to, you know, to sort of divide off the pasture in that, that you're not running a tractor out um, and you're spreading out your sort of damage across the pasture and that, you know, with those round bales that we're not concentrating as much on one spot. Going through and looking at pasture choices. So, you know, making sure that we've got well-drained pastures and that when we running into the wetter portions of the season and that, and making sure that we're able to sort of get to these areas that'll give us sort of better runoff and that and better drainage. So this is, um, this is a wood chip sort of um, system. And this is something we've played with a little bit in some of our sort of farms in Ohio um, that we're looking for good outdoor access areas and that couldn't necessarily afford to put in sort of heavy concrete and that. So looking through and building and you build sort of good drainage systems underneath, it's a little bit more, a little less expensive um, than going through and putting in sort of concrete, but it does take a little bit sort of more maintenance and that. And depending on how you're going, you either need um, some way to manage runoff or if you've got sort of good, um, you know, natural ecosystems that can run through, you can get filtration that way and that, you know, that can certainly sort of work. But otherwise, you have to be careful with sort of runoff for these systems. And then last things, and as, last things is the extreme events, you know. So like our sort of tornadoes that came through in that in December, but you know, also those really sort of late season, and we haven't seen one really recently, but those late season heavy snow events where we end up with sort of power outages and that to deal with, you know, how do we end up sort of preparing for some of these emergency events as we're, as we're moving forward. Anyone know who this is? So little, little while back, so this is, his nickname was Sully. Chesley um, Sullenberger and that. So he was the pilot that landed the plane on the Hudson River back in 2009. So one of these things, I mean, there's nothing more of an emergency event than finding you're sitting on a plane and both engines have gone out um, and trying to figure out sort of what to do. So this was a plane that took off from LaGuardia in New York, ran into a flock of geese that uh, basically destroyed both engines. So they turned that plane pretty much into a glider pretty quickly. So the pilots had to go through and figure out, you know, what do they end up doing? So they set up, fortunately, aviation have very good sort of emergency systems so they could go through the checklist of, right, where's the local airport so they can go through. They ran through the system. The pilots had been, re had been well trained in, you know, how to respond to this so they could go through and make decisions in the moment and that of, that airport's not going to work, that airport's not going to work. And then last part of it was, I mean, the pilot who was running this, um, the Sullenberger, was an ex sort of uh, Air Force pilot with many, many, many years of experience. So there was a degree of sort of understanding in that how to make decisions within the within the sort of environment and or within the, the moment. And he landed the plane down on the Hudson River. You know, all those passengers there as well, having sat through. I know most of us in that, if you ever fly, sit through that first portion of the, uh, the sort of emergency response and try and ignore it and that of what to do in a crash of a landing and that and what to do. That all became very, very real for these folks when they had to realize how to uh, evacuate where their life jackets were, you know, and how to respond sort of appropriately in that um, within the moment. So as much as it seems that, you know, we can't, how can we be ready for an emergency in that? 
you know, even the most sort of unforeseen events and that, you know, having a plan and having gone through some of these basic steps at least gives us a start um, as to what we're going to do. So remembering in a disaster, we're, we're already behind there. So during an emergency, and most of the stuff you guys will know, but this is a sort of review we're going through, but our, our priorities going through will be human safety number one, sort of animal safety number two, and then sort of last is focusing on sort of protecting property and that if possible. Once we've got through, you know, addressing any remaining hazards, um, you know, uh, potential sort of stray electricity, um, things like that, any potential hazards would be number one, then going through and addressing immediate needs for the, the people and the animals, and then focusing on sort of recovery. So when you are sitting down and saying, okay, how do I end up sort of developing an emergency plan sort of for my farm? Um, you know, the first place to think is, you know, how do we expect the unexpected? So what's going to be the potential sort of issues in that for the emergencies for this neck of the woods? You know, common ones we think of, of course, is, you know, farm accident, you know, and that's not necessarily weather related, but that would fall into this category and that. But weather related tornadoes, you know, snow and ice events and that would definitely be heavy for this area. Blizzards, probably not as much. You know, wildfires cross our fingers, you know, not necessarily sort of as commonly within this area, but what events are going to be likely here? And then going through the mental exercise of saying, you know, faced with a scenario like that, you know, what things would you need to prioritize, you know, um, as you're going through? What are the things that need to be done and that if you're facing this? So tornado comes through, blows down the barn, we've got animals, hopefully your animals survived, you know, where do we end up sort of needing to move animals as we're going through? You know, what are, you know, what things are critical? You know, feeding animals, milking if you've got a sort of dairy, you know, making sure we've got water supplies and that, you know, what things are going to be critical for the, for the near future. Heaven forbid if you lose animals, you know, maybe even another critical thing would be dealing with mortalities, you know, as, we, as we're sort of looking at that. But then, um, you know, who is critical too? You know, emergency responders, but also, you know, maybe people on the farm. And another one we don't often think about is, what if, you know, as the solo sort of farm uh, manager or the primary sort of, um, you know, manager on the farms, what if you're the one who's, you know, who's injured or who's, who's incapacitated in that? You know, do you have someone who can step in? And it doesn't necessarily have to be someone on the farm. You know, do you have a neighbor or someone that you can say, do you mind being, you know, the cross-trained sort of person for my farm? You know, as, as someone who could step in and take over your operation. And then sort of what would you need it on hand? You know, what things can you prepare sort of ahead of time, like a couple of days of feed and water and that, um, you know, that you know you have that on hand. Sort of additional resources and that, generators um, that we can have on hand. And then what resources are available in the community, you know, um, that'll be available in that. And then going through, have we, you know, have we prepared sort of staff and family um, to go through and face an emergency? You know, like those passengers on that plane, if you've gone through the scenario once of how do we end up responding to this, it comes a lot more naturally. You know, everyone knows their roles, um, you know, in, in an emergency situation and that and what they need to do. So we're more likely to be prepared. So key things in that in building a plan. So each specific type of emergency is in that, key needs, key people. You know, what resources and where are your contacts? So even if it's, you know, who would you reach out to for sort of fixing the milking system or, you know, additional feed if you're needing to sort of get hold of your, your feed contractor and that, then what do you need to train your staff and family? And then last part, keeping that up sort of regularly. You know, a plan that you developed 10 years ago where half the people have turned over on the farm, not necessarily going to be as sort of helpful as something that you're looking at on a regular basis. Going through and training fast um, sort of family and that and staff and these, this is sort of um, actually a group of military officers and that, that I had the opportunity to work with on my last job at University of Pennsylvania. And these guys are actually the on the ground logistics people um, in war situations. So they get the ultimate job of stepping in on emergency situations and, and sort of working with civilians on the ground and saying, what do they end up needing? And they wanted to know what were the critical things, you know, when it came to sort of agricultural um, sort of operations and that you know, when they're moving into a country that they need to think about in, in sort of war situations. So a little bit more bizarre um, variation of it, but, you know, the ultimate sort of, of how do you end up sort of preparing for, for these, these um, sort of situations. 
So when we're going through sort of training family and that, and it doesn't have to be something really involved, but thinking through, you know, with family and that and or staff and that and saying, right, what would we do in these situations? Where is the list of phone numbers and that for the critical people you need to sort of get hold of? You know, who's responsible for checking this sort of group of animals and that? You know, who do you not want to, maybe on some farms, you know, be on the front lines sort of within the emergency <laughs> event? Say you've got sort of young kids and that just to say, guys, you're not responsible for this if something like that ends up sort of happening. And then just making sure things like, you know, whoops, sorry. Um, making sure you've got um, the tools that you end up sort of needing and that available. Um, and as I said, that everything's sort of updated. Then also sort of resources, um, and this was actually taken in Pennsylvania and that in 2016 um, after a similar sort of tornado event. But I think, you know, a lot of our sort of plain community folks and that are way ahead of us um, when it comes to sort of community resources and that, you know, and the ability of the community to really sort of come together and that um, in facing some of these sort of uh, more severe sort of emergencies in that, um, you know, and going through and really sort of providing that help that the community needs. But, you know, preparing in that and knowing what your resources are ahead of time so you're able to sort of respond um, after an emergency. So here in Kentucky, um, you know, our Kentucky Department of Agriculture has been helping with some of the, the tornado relief and that on the agriculture side, knowing the sort of folks to reach out to in that sort of there. As I said, local cooperatives, you know, maybe the cooperative um, that you're working with and that can provide resources and help. And then the local community as well, you know, and that's everything from the neighboring farms, um, you know, coming in and helping that, but also sort of, you know, local churches and that and organizations that can work, you can work with and that, so. So as I said in the beginning with this, it's more about making you guys think about this rather than necessarily giving you all the answers here. So hopefully I'll get you guys sort of thinking as we're moving forward in that of what's changing and what things can you do today, you know, that will maybe set you up in that um, as we move in for you in the future. Even if it's something as simple as planting a few trees in the pasture so that we get a little bit more shade sort of down the road. So thank you very much. Any questions? Yes. Uh, could you get kind of specific on how that wood chip uh, feedlot was built? Absolutely. So, and I can certainly sort of send you some of the more specific sort of logistics on that, but what they end up sort of doing with it was go through and sort of set up um, initial sort of drainage. So they built up basically sort of uh, ditches, you know, through the whole system and that set the piping down through the ditches, which was their runoff. Um, then they ended up doing a layer of uh, sort of gravel down initially, bigger, larger gravel and that for good drainage, and then set the wood chips. And the wood chips initially are about 12 inches deep. So 12 to 18 was what they were looking at within the, within the sort of project. And each year they go through and take off the, the first six inches, replace that, you know, that would be what was sort of soiled and that going through and then go through and replace that top sort of six inches. And they found that that was the maintenance that they needed to do sort of year on year with it. Um, stocking density wise, they're looking at about like beef cows, they were looking at between 80 and 90 square feet per animal. Um, dairy cows, you probably, if you're looking at the big, bigger cows, like a Holstein or something like that, you know, about 130 square feet per animal. So the challenge with that is it's a fairly sort of open space um, or large space that you're needing to sort of provide there. Other thing that we found, and I've had, like there was one farm we worked with that ended up sort of running it off and, you know, they ended up having a good um, sort of ecosystem that could purify the water that we were running off. But you also have to think, do I, am I going to have runoff that I have to worry about with, um, you know, with your, your sort of nutrient management and that. So that would be another thing certainly to keep an eye on if you're looking at building a system like that. But it gives you, you're getting a little bit more filtration than you would with concrete and a little bit less of a sort of runoff. So you've got a little bit more sort of um, control of, of sort of runoff in those cases. And it's not cheap and I have to look, um, it's been a while since I looked at the numbers, but it's gonna be um, a lot cheaper than concrete, but it's not necessarily cheap um, to sort of put in initially. But it's something that I found, we had a couple of farms that were looking at it that couldn't afford concrete, you know, where they were. Um, so it was a good system to look at as an alternative. So. 
so yeah, you built on a, a grade with your sort of drainage off a little bit. And then, as I said, you know, you use sort of mounds and, and ditches through it to sort of direct the runoff. Yeah. And then you would, for the runoff part, then you would want a grass area. Yeah, and certainly a sort of grass area. And I mean, that would be something probably to work with a local ag engineer just to make sure that you're not ending up sort of creating more of a, a problem that you've got enough um, you know, you've got enough sort of to, to sort of um, take up, uh, you know, any nutrient runoff that you're getting in that. So, yeah. Yeah. You mentioned NRCS for grants on water. Would they also be a resource maybe if you wanted to put more trees? They Absolutely. Okay. Yep. Yep. So they would be, and it, each state's going to vary a little bit, you know, with what grants are available in that for, for different projects. But most of them, anything that's a lot of times when we're looking at increasing rotational grazing, so anything that will increase the rotational grazing system, absolutely. So fencing, um, lanes, um, you know, water sort of supplies for pasture and that, they're often very heavy on grants, absolutely, because it's all about sort of uh, sustainability and, and environmental. So trees, you know, if you're looking at putting in silver pastures, and I'll have to have a look, there might be, Probably not in Kentucky, but I know there's a couple of grants in some of the other states we've been looking at, Pennsylvania and places like that, that are directed specifically at, at sort of money for silvo pastures. So that's something that there might be more beyond even um, sort of NRCS and that for getting grants in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and there was, it was a study that was done, um, the researcher was based out of Canada and that, but looking through actually it, and they had finished the full first lactation, you know, when they published the study and that, so they looked at heifers that were born and had a documented heat stress period in the, la in the last uh, sort of third of gestation versus heifers that didn't, um, you know, and ended up sort of going through and comparing them and they saw a statistical significant difference, um, you know, in milk production and that through that whole first lactation probably going to carry over but you know we haven't necessarily got the research in that to sort of go further in that and say that that ends up affecting now you know how significant would that be because this was in conventional dairy how significant would that be within our organic systems you know we'd have to have a look at but it's certainly something you know we're not completely different beasts that we're dealing with so something that's affecting the health um, you know and, and sort of production and that within our organic within our dairy animals whether they're organic or conventional and that will definitely sort of carry over. Well, thank you guys very much.